This is KC Sports Network, proudly presented by M Prize Bank. What's up, Chiefs? And welcome into a special KCSN Draft Show here live in Indianapolis. We're in the Indianapolis Convention Center right now, hanging out with Brett Coleman, my guy Brett. Um, we've got a great week here at the NFL Combine, but Brett, I got to ask you a first question: uh, Why do you hate the Chiefs? <laughs> okay. I'm going to do a nuanced take here. It's not allowed. You can't. I know. I know. I know. Because people see like, I work for the Chargers. He must hate the Chiefs. I hate the Chiefs. I've actually been coming on and talking to you guys longer than I've ever worked for the Chargers. Okay. (laughs) I've done more Chiefs content in my life than Chargers content. Um, But I will say the the discourse around the Chiefs has has been a little bit hilarious to me because I think people have kind of lost the plot a little bit. Yeah. You know, and I, I kind of made fun of this stat too, but you saw the whole chart of like Chiefs were the luckiest playoff team ever, highest win probability added through like crazy fumbles and mm-hmm. calls and drops and everything like that. And like, oh my God, fraud, Super Bowl, Chiefs, super lucky. Right. And how I looked at it, which is, which I think is the proper way to look at it is yes, the Chiefs are lucky, but do you know what luck is? It's preparation meeting opportunity. And they are the one They're team. Heads. That when they get a goal line fumble, when they get a big drop, when they get a, a tip drill pick, they capitalize on it. Yeah. Like every team gets those plays. Every team has just kind of lucky, weird stuff happen to them. But who actually cashes in on it more than Kansas City? Nobody. Nobody. Like if you let them up off the mat, they will beat you. That's why right. I picked them to win the Super Bowl. You know, like people forget. People forget you. Two forget. years in a row, I picked him to win the Super Bowl. <laughs> like, yeah, huge Chiefs hater, Brett Coleman over uh-huh. here. No, I just think we needed to clear the air because every time you come on, we see the YouTube comments of "Get Brett off of here." Brett hates the Chiefs. Everything. Like, Brett doesn't hate the Chiefs. He doesn't do it. Okay, but I, I had to have you on because obviously this is a case system draft show. We're going to talk draft. But there's a lot of things going on in the free agency realm of things that really kicked off Tuesday when Brett Beach and Andy Reid took the podium. That's the news about Jerry Sneed and Chris Jones. There's been news come out about him that that will really impact the draft. And I, and I want to start with Jerry Sneed. I want to get your thoughts on that whole situation because I think it's, it's a really interesting situation because Nate Taylor mentioned this on our Only Weird Games podcast, works for The Athletic as well. The Chiefs did everything right. But Jerry C did everything right, mm-hmm. and now they're getting punished for finding a guy in the third round. They have to franchise tag him because, you know, they're the way that their things go. So it's a very interesting situation how it's going and how things have moved so quickly. It really does seem like Jerry C might get moved sooner rather than later. You know, the Chiefs are one of the teams that benefited the most from that $30 million cap increase because yeah. all of a sudden they, so. they got room to do some stuff. I'm still... Not 100% sure. And again, it's based on restructures and cuts and everything. I'm still not sure if they will have room to do both Chris and Legarius. Yep. I'm sure they would like to, right? I'm sure, like, when a team has an opportunity for a 3 P, you don't just jettison really good players, mm. right? Like, if they can make it work, they'll make it work. Um, but the hard part is making it work. Right. Because obviously Legarius is going to want top of market money because he had the third most press coverage snaps in the entire NFL and gave up 14 first downs the entire season. So, yeah. Pretty good, yeah. right? You know, and and so you got to figure out how. Okay, how can we keep Chris Jones in house and make him a cheap for life? It's you know between thirty to thirty five million. I, I guess we'll see. I'm sure it's going to be a big number, yeah. but while also keeping Legarius, you know, together with with Trent and 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 with Nick and all those guys, like this was a an incredible defense. A defense that I think we're going to talk about for a long time. Oh, but yeah. Defenses like that tend to get expensive pretty quick, and I just don't know. I don't know if they're going to do it. I don't know what you think about that. I think that that might have been one of the most underrated defenses of all time. With the Chiefs. oh yeah, and, and oh yeah, I don't think they get the respect that they do, as you had mentioned, just because you know, the guy was on the other side of the ball, right? Uh, I think a lot of people too, when you talk about Tom Brady and like his greatest, people forget how good his defenses were. Like, and that might happen with this defense. I don't think it should because they had an, an insane run to the Super Bowl. Like, the, their defense was up there with. No one's going to touch like the the O2 Ravens or anything like that, right? But no one's going to touch those guys. They weren't but, that like, far off. They were far. That's the <laughs> like, thing. And far off. They're they're really good. Like I mean, obviously, with when you talk about Chris Jones and Legarius Sneed, that's an interesting one because he's like sneaky old. Like Legarius Sneed's twenty seven. Well, he was a much older prospect, right? Right. And there was reasons for that that like nobody's going to hold that against him because like if you come into the league and as a 22, 23 year old and you immediately ball out, which he did. Like good players are good players, right? Yeah, but like it is a factor. Like this is probably his last big contract. For sure. So, 
just to be completely open and honest about it, a player who was a not a first round pick, but a, a middle round pick that didn't get the crazy huge rookie deal that already has Super Bowls under his belt. The last box to check is let's get generational wealth and take care of the family forever. Yeah. This is his best and perhaps only opportunity to do that, which is why unless the Chiefs are literally the biggest offer, I I don't know if he's going to stay. I, I'm sure they're going to try, but... Yeah, and it's a shame, too. You look at the tag, the tag is like almost 20 million. I think it's like 19.8, something like that. I, I, we've had people say, like, oh, if, if, if I'm a legendary seed, I'm not playing. Dude's made $4 million to his career. He's going to play on a $19 million tag. So yeah. it's a really interesting situation because I think that the fact that they were so quick to say, we're going to tag him and also look for a trade. And also we've given him permission to talk to teams. It makes you think, well, if you're just like reading the tea leaves, it makes you think that he's going to probably not be in Kansas City next year. My guess is they already floated their number to his camp. His yeah. camp already said no, which is why they came out and said tag. But also give me your offers, right? Because like if if they can't budge off the number and he can't budge off the number he wants, like they still want him in the building, so obviously you can do the tag, but like they're going to listen to offers because somebody's going to come in and offer top market, right? And they're also going to want to do it before Jalen Johnson signs cuz Jalen Johnson's going to break the market too. Yeah. It's all, it's all a really interesting and in, in a nuanced situation. Another one that's really interesting to kind of follow and how it kind of impacts what the Chiefs do in the draft is the Chris Jones situation. Like, we know the saga went on that last year. It was long and drawn out in a process that maybe didn't necessarily need to happen. Chris has made it clear that he wants to be in Kansas City. What do you think he goes for? I, I'm just curious what, what your thoughts are on that, because another year older, another year over 30, do you think he gets maybe the big contract that he's looking for? The only question for me is guarantees, is in how many years mm-hmm. are guaranteed. I would say, again, I don't, I don't think it's going to be like top, top, top of market, because there's maybe some. It'll start with a three. How about that? So 30, 30, 31, 32 for three years, two years guaranteed, and I, and I think by then he'll be what thirty three, thirty four. Yeah, you know, probably five times Super Bowl champion. <laughs> You know, like I think I think he'll he'll take that because at that point, okay, you've made like a quarter billion dollars in your yeah. career and, and you won five Super Bowls like you did. OK, that's the thing about Chris, too, is that Chris isn't in the same position as Legarius is in. like mm-hmm. Chris has had the second contract. Chris has made a decent amount of money, right? <laughs> yeah, decent, <laughs> a decent. And we can say, uh, but that's he's not looking for that big payday. Well, he is, but like he doesn't necessarily need the big payday is what, I, what I'm trying to say. And I think it's going to be really interesting, especially to the construction of the defense, because that defense has been built around Chris for so long. I think it's so funny. Like the result of the Super Bowl, I think drastically impacted whether he was staying or going. Mm. If they lost, I I would feel a lot better about saying he's probably, you know, hitting the road. But the fact they won. Yeah. I think he now realizes like, hey, I have the possibility to be one of the only defensive linemen ever to to be a four time Super Bowl winner, let alone a five time Super Bowl winner. Yeah. Like I could be a first ballot Hall of Famer. I mean, he's already a Hall of Famer in my eyes, but like he could be like, no doubt, first ballot, don't even debate. Like we spend thirty seconds, you know, on the discussion when we choose who like he could be that guy. And I think he realizes that and also get thirty million a year. And so if I was him, that's that's a factor. It is for sure. And I do think that it's going to be really interesting because when we started this process, this free agency process, we, at least myself, I can't speak for anybody else. I had the, okay, you got to have at least one of Legere's or one of Chris. Uh, you got to have one of those guys back because I don't know if you can, well, they probably can because it, Brett Beach is really good at this job. But going going into like the next season without Legere's and without Chris would be a very interesting situation. Now they find themselves in a, in a, in a position where that could be a pretty real possibility, especially if Chris doesn't agree to a deal by the time, you know, March 11th rolls around, legal tampering period hits, and Chris is free to hit the market there. And with Chris it hits the market, if he hears other numbers that the Chiefs are, like the Chiefs are offering him a little bit less than a lot of te- teams are going, maybe he doesn't necessarily give uh, the Chiefs the benefit of the doubt at that point. But it's going to be really interesting to see the defensive identity going forward. And it, it really seems like that the Chiefs are favoring Chris over the Jason in this situation, to me at least. Which is, 
that to me is a bet on themselves to find more good DBs because yeah. if there's one thing this team can draft better than maybe anybody else in the NFL, it's DB. Like they are phenomenal at at finding corners that fit exactly what Spags like Spags likes, which is generally like, hey, go beat that guy up. Like yeah. they're they're really good at finding guys that that yeah. play physical, that can tackle in the run game. You know that that are very smart because again, it's not a it's not an easy defense. Yeah, and like you got to be really smart with how with all the coverage rotations they call and all the, the wild blitzes they call it. Like you you have to be able to think not just pre snap but post snap very very quickly and be able to process and understand like how your role and how your technique is changing based on what you're seeing pre and post snap. Yeah, they have a bunch of guys that are really good at doing that. They're really good communicators, and oh by the way, they tackle like crazy. Um, so. It, it, it's it's a hard profile to find, but they're one of the teams that I think does it better in the NFL. So if there's any position, they could they could look at it like round two, round three, and find somebody. Yeah. I'm not saying they're going to be Legarius Sneed, <laughs> but they'll be good. That's a thing, too. And that, that's what kind of leads into the draft here as well, because we talk about Brett Veach being so good at identifying those mid to late round talents, especially at the quarterback position. I wonder how much to you that does impact the Chiefs draft strategy. If you you think about that, we know that every year Brett Veach is going to pick a corner, right, or or a safety, or probably a guy. He's got his guys. Yeah, he, he's got a couple of those. Um, how do you think that that really impacts how the Chiefs approach, maybe even like round one, the earlier rounds uh, of of the draft with both of these guys in their situations? I think we've we've seen how it's affected their approach. You know, like they they did the one high pick on McDuffie just because McDuffie was like so obviously good <laughs> that they're like, okay, I mean, we we got it. Right. Why is he there? Yeah, and that proved to be correct. Proved to be correct. Yeah, should have been Super Bowl MVP. It might have been. I know it's not like a super hot take, but like he was phenomenal. He was. That is, that film is like teach tape for oh for like a cornerback. Like, He's so good. His his game was just incredible. It makes sense why he was an All Pro, right? And Legereski should have been an All Pro as well. Yeah, but they had two All Pro corners on that on that defense essentially, and he was like. Quietly, one of the best corners in the league. I think. Yeah, no, he was. Uh, that might be the best big game I've seen from a DB in quite a while. Yeah, like in terms of just like, hey, all the pressure in the world, you're going up against an all pro one on one the entire day, uh-huh. and you win. Incredible. And, by the way, that's the reason why I. Everybody who's like, oh, who do you think is going to pop off in this game? I was like, I don't know, but definitely not Ayuk and Debo. Like, I told people that <laughs> leading up to the game, and nobody believed me. Well, laughing now. We are. <laughs> um, so that is always interesting when we talk about because I think the Chiefs are in a spot to where, you know, picking at 32 again is is tough because you have to see how the board falls, right? The lug- it, this is, These are rich people problems. This is a, this is these are problems we talk about in Kansas City. Yeah, I, I'm one of the poor's Hudson, over in LA. Right, it's just nah. pick five. Well, what's a playoff berth? I don't you, know. you can pick wherever, whenever, whoever you want. We got to wait for 31 other teams to pick before we can even go. Uh, but so that's the hard part. Is like you got to wait for the board to fall. So it's always tough to be like, oh, who are you picking at 32? And it's like, well, free agency hasn't started. Um, 31 other teams have to pick, so we have to kind of see how that all falls. But I think the Chiefs are kind of in a spot at 31 or 32. They got a lot of options, like positionally if they want to move up if they want to move back i feel like that they've got all the all the capital that they can use to to move up or get some more capital to to move back especially when you talk about the legendary sneed trade possibly getting more capital in return to maybe package to move up if they really do like a guy so what do you think about the chiefs options that they got at 30 i mean to tie it in the last question like the fact that they are so good at finding db late means that they can they can have confidence in that and they can attack other positions that maybe they've had a, a lower hit rate on to be yeah. diplomatic about yeah. it. They can attack those earlier with prospects that have a higher chance of hitting. Now, it it seems like they've kind of gotten better at receiver over the last year. They yep. hit on Rashi. Yep. But also the thing with Rashi is he plays a very particular role. Mm-hmm. And they still need a, a, a deep threat. Uh Rashi, like his average depth of target was under five yards, right? And he's one of the most insane yak talents in the NFL. Um, but that was his role. Like he only had eight targets of 20 plus yards the entire year. So they still need to find somebody who can stretch the field. That's what they wanted Sky Moore to be. Didn't really work out. That's what they wanted MBS to be. Really only worked out in January <laughs> every year. Um, but yeah. like consistently from the start of this 
from the start of the season. Like it, it felt like they just couldn't go vertical, even with Rasheed being a great, great rookie. Yeah. He was a great rookie in a particular way. So I think, again, to tie it all together, their confidence in getting DP late means they can attack receiver early. And at 32 specifically, there are going to be good receivers there, but I don't necessarily think it's going to be the one that they really, really need. So I think they might actually go up. Because mm. I don't think Adonai Mitchell, who fits them perfectly, is going to make it to him. Yeah. He's the dream scenario. Well, my nightmare scenario, your dream scenario. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Brian Thomas Jr. is not making it to 32, right. so they'd have to go up for him. Because the guys that are generally going to be in that range, like if you're a big Troy Franklin fan, okay. But again, I I think they're... I, I, I'm not as high on Troy Franklin as other people, which sure. of course means the Chiefs are going to take him. He's going to be an all-pro. But <laughs> I, I think for the particular role they need to fill, those guys are going to go 12 picks before them, and yeah. so they might have to go up, especially to beat Buffalo to the punch. Right. And that's what's going to be interesting because I do think that there's going to be a real wide receiver room overhaul. Uh, we saw MVS was cut earlier this week, and they didn't waste any time doing that one. They could they could have <laughs> no, waited a couple weeks for that, but they said, no, you know what? Go, your, go. your ring's in the mail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but they did that, and, and Michael Hardman, a free agent right now. Yeah. Uh, so, so they've got a couple of guys that, that are free agents. Could be a lot of new faces in there, too. Rasheed Rice, Sky Moore coming back off an injury. Um, and, and Rasheed played a completely different role than what we saw in college him play. So it's one of those things where maybe they do see something with one of these wide receivers, like a Troy Franklin, where, you know, Pat doesn't throw the ball outside the numbers a whole lot, right? Uh, so it's it's one of those deals where if you give a wide receiver that does a lot of those things, uh, maybe he does do it or, or they just completely change his role like they did with Rasheed Rice and to make it fit with the Chiefs. But I do think that there's a lot of interesting options uh, at 32 uh, at the wide receiver position. And it's such a deep class. And I was talking to Dan oh, yeah. Kugler about this, but there's going to be deep wide receiver classes for, I'm pretty sure, the rest of time. Because like that's just how, it, how football's going. Every wide receiver class is going to be deep. Would you be surprised if the Chiefs like double up on wide receiver? No, Jeff? they should. They should double up. Yeah. And you know, to your point about oh, receivers deep every year. Receivers deep every year because these kids are growing up playing seven on seven. Yeah, and they get like ten thousand routes by the time they get to college. That's also a big reason why they're so good at getting DB. Because guess what? There's there's corners that are playing That's seven true. on seven, yeah. and yeah. it's like, hey man, we got to cover all day long. Like both of those position groups are getting deeper and deeper and deeper because these kids are growing up doing that. And so, yeah, they'll they'll double dip at both positions, I think, just because yeah. that's where the talent is. It's really interesting, you know, the offensive side of the ball, um, with what they could get, a running back of position that we had talked about, even a free agency. Maybe the Chiefs could dabble in that market a little bit. I don't know if they're going to be spending for the uh, the big name guys, right? I, but. I love Isaiah, but his running style, like, it's, we got we to preserve him. Yeah. We got to save him from himself sometimes. It's like, let's let's... Let's dial back the carries a little bit. Let's have somebody else take some damage. And then when it gets to December and January, like, all right, Pacheco. You can do it now. Go kill that guy. <laughs> yeah, that's be, that's his thing. Be angry at the ground. So that's the thing, too. You look at the the running back position, you know, I think it's a pretty big need, actually, that the Chiefs have because uh, Jerick McKinnon's going to be gone. He's going to be older. He has another injury. He had a groin injury, a, a core muscle injury. That dude's had so many injuries. But he's been able to be a very vital role for Vital piece for this team in their their two Super Bowl runs. I wouldn't anticipate him to be back, but I wouldn't also be upset if he was back. Mm -hmm. uh, Clyde Ridgeler is hitting the market as a free agent. We'll see how that goes for him if he does come back. I believe when I looked up his approximate value uh, from Spot Track, it was like one point six. So like yeah, somewhere around there. I feel like the Chiefs would be okay with bringing him back around that that price range. A guy who already knows the offense, a guy who's been around, who's a great locker room. Guy. Everyone loves him in the locker room. That running back room is like kind of the nucleus of that locker room. Um, so I'm going to be really interested to see what they do in free agency or even in the draft because there, there's some good guys. Um, probably late, late into day two, maybe early day three that they could find and then be a solid contributor. I think the the best fit again. I, I he might go a little bit earlier than what they're willing to commit to that position because they got other stuff they got to address. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Trey Benson, Florida State. Oh, I like him. Yeah, he fits exactly what they do. I mean, boy, if you love somebody who can run shotgun counter, Trey Fenson's your guy. <laughs> you know, the Chiefs run that a lot. Uh, great feet. You know, he's a bigger back, 220 plus. He's going to run today. Um, I again, we're, this, we're doing this before times, right? right yeah. Um, but when you watch him on tape, he's he's a bigger back who's who's interesting because 
he'll get to the corner and you'll be like, okay, yeah, they're going to catch. Oh, they're not catching him. Oh God, he ran away. Yeah. Like he has like, I don't want to say sneaky speed. It's kind of in your face speed, but for a bigger back, we know the chiefs love two ten plus running backs that run four, three. Yeah. Like I think he fits exactly what they like. The real question is if they're willing to do it in the second round. Cause I think he might go there. Yeah. That's, that's the problem I think is that maybe the running backs that fit the chiefs really well, as you mentioned, might not be in the spots that they want to take. Yeah. Um, but again, we haven't seen, we've seen the chiefs traditionally take players that are not widely addressed as valuable, right? Positionally in the draft early. I mean, you talk about the was that 2021 draft when it was Nick Bolton and Creed Humphrey in the second round, a, a pair of second round picks. And you're like, you picked a center and a linebacker with your two that second turns round out picks. They're pretty good. And yeah. so you, you, I've stopped like worrying about positional, like, value when it comes to like what the chiefs do and like how they spend the money also not my money so yeah. i don't get to decide uh but like in the draft i know people are like oh i i like him here but like the value of that pick isn't good it doesn't matter as soon as it's picked right and you go you go on the field and, and everything works itself out there but in terms of just like how brett veach and, and his team approach positional value is is a lot different than i think a lot of other teams do they uh you know dj kind of made this point about baltimore earlier this week uh, daniel jeremiah made this point about Baltimore earlier this week where he's like, they will pick, what do you want to, I guess off meta, yeah, you know, positions like Kyle Hamilton, you know, they took a first round center, but that's because they really stick to a a BPA philosophy and regardless of position, best player is best player. Right. And the chiefs do that too. Like when when Creed fell to them, first of all, I was screaming my head off the entire time. I was like, there is no way he fell that far. And they felt the same way. Like, we don't care he's a center. Like, it's Creed freaking Humphrey. Like, mm-hmm. He's going to be a top five center in the league the moment he steps foot on the field. And I was actually wrong about that. He was top three yeah. in the NFL <laughs> the moment he stepped on the field. And so, like, they don't care about, I mean, they care about taking premium positions. Yeah. But if if somebody is so obviously a good player at a non-premium position, they would rather do that and then be set for the next six to eight years and not have to worry about it and then go after somebody at, at a premium position that's a little bit more further down the board. All right, we're at the combine, so let's talk about some guys at the combine that you've seen. You've been on the field, you've been seeing these guys run, you've been seeing all these guys do drills. Who's impressed you the most here? Uh, Rabbit Taylor Demerson, which you know he was at Shrine Bowl. And he we, was. We yeah. talked to him, and he's he's lit up the interviews. Everybody loves him yes. in interviews. Um, I I didn't know that he ran four four two, and I was like, okay, like I knew he was fast. I didn't have any GPS numbers, but mm-hmm. kind of putting a time to it, it's like. Okay. Yeah. So now we got range, we got hips, we got feet, we got short area explosiveness, leadership, intelligence, ball skill. Like, what am I missing here? Yeah. He's actually one of the more Chiefs ish DBs in this mm-hmm. class. Because it's like, is he a nickel? Is he a safety? The answer is yes. Like, and, and we know Spags <laughs> loves those types. So I, I could see him being a quote unquote down the board D, but it's really like third round. Yeah. Um, although I've heard some teams maybe even earlier than that. So we'll see. Um, Taj Washington, if we, we want to talk about receivers that, that fit yeah, what the Chiefs need right now. Again, down the board guy. Saw him at Shrine Bowl. Great separator. Great speed. Um, also f- for like a small dude, having a 65% contested catch rate is pretty insane. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm still working on the tight end class, but uh, but Tip's really intriguing me. Tip is incredible. Like just him as a human being, as just like how big he is, his name um, is in- the name Tiff is he just awesome. sounds like an eight year player. Right? He does. He does like running what he did at like was he almost two eighty? He's like yeah, seventy three or something like that. He put up like twenty eight in the bench earlier this morning. <laughs> I was out there with my phone. The whole room was just like ah. like they love the whole room loves Tiff here. Like he's great. That, and I and when I was talking with uh, Dane Brugler about it, he said he's incredibly mature. Like he is a he's a very mature guy. And he said the coaches in Illinois sometimes said he was too mature. Like, you're like, okay, you got to have fun with this, too. Like, you got to have a little bit of that. So uh, this tight end class is interesting just because it's not as good as last year's class, right? I think yeah. I think you could say this. Is any class, class as good as last year's class? No. Yeah, Brock Bowers <laughs> and everybody else basically that's happening uh, with this class. But uh, I, I do think there's been some uh, really good performances. Um, we, we talk about, we've seen a lot of the defensive guys, the defensive players go. Anyone that... that uh, kind of caught your eye that maybe you weren't necessarily anticipating them to test as high as they did, but that they tested a whole lot better than you thought. You know, Byron Murphy came in a little bit smaller than I expected, mm. uh, but he still looked just as explosive and just as fluid as I expected. 
And I, at this point, I, for a three technique, if you measure it at six foot, even like I almost don't even care at this point. Like, how many guys have we seen come in the league at that size and just fine? So I think he might go uh, earlier than Kalijah Kansi did, and it was a similar yeah. size profile, similar type of role. Um, again, if we're looking for a three technique in Kansas City, he's not going to make it to thirty two, but he's a trade up candidate in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Somebody who could make it to thirty two um, that is also a freak athlete that they could consider whether they have Chris back or not, because they still need to find like an understudy. Yeah. Uh, Chris Jenkins, Michigan freak show. I mean, his nickname's literally the mutant. Like he is, he's an incredible athlete. Um, Fisk, the Florida state kid. Yep. Again, crazy. Like this, this class is pretty sneaky when it comes to interior defensive lineman athleticism. Mm -hmm. Um, There's going to be a lot of them that go in the first, in the first couple rounds, maybe in the first three rounds. Um, the one thing with with uh, with this DT class that I can't figure out is where Tavondre Sweat's going to go, mm. because how many teams are going to take a three hundred sixty six pound nose tackle in the first round? Like, it's important. It's absolutely an important role in my view. I just don't think the NFL thinks it's it's. I mean, for sure, it's nose tackle, and I've I've fallen in love with nose tackles every single year, and they end up going like a hundred picks later than I expect. Yeah. So yeah. again, I think I'm just a freak that really likes big <laughs> dudes in the middle. I love Tavondre. Um, I think he'd be great in Kansas City, but I I just don't know if the NFL values that position. It's like Kendrick Ober last year, you know. Yeah, he was great. Yeah, like he was he, great. You watch, you turn on the film, you're like, why was this guy a six rounder? Like, yeah, you you have no idea. But like, there's not very many teams that have a need at nose, right? Because uh, they only have one, maybe two guys. Yeah. And so like, if you, if you're if you're needing to draft a nose in the first round, like there's only one or two of them. Like Kendrick Ober guy. You know, there's a couple of noses in front of him, and, and just uh, kind of you know, how people valued him. Uh, but Tavares Sweat is, is such an interesting case because he is a really good athlete. Like he ran a surprise. I can't remember what it was. It was like a four six. He was. Uh, so I was next to the Amazon like next gen stats table um, when they were like going through times, and I think he ran the fastest forty ever by a player that's like three fifty or above, or no three fifty or above. We're in the fastest 40 ever. That's insane. So he's he's a really, really good athlete for his size. Um, I was also over at, um, yeah, have you seen them where they do the hamstring tests? Yeah. He hit, so basically for people that don't know, uh, like you stand on the edge of a table and there's like a ruler that goes down and then, you know, straight legs, bend down, take your hands like that and you, and you see how far below the table you can go. You got five and a half inches below the table. Like his, he is flexible. Wow. For a big dude. And he hit 25 inches in the vert, which doesn't sound like a crazy number until you realize that's 366 pounds going that far up. So like, he's a really, really good athlete. I think he's a great player. I think the role is important. I just don't know if the NFL thinks the role is important. It's going to be really interesting talking about interior guys, edge rushers. The Chiefs need those guys. Like The yeah. Chiefs need help on the on the defensive line. They're going to have a lot. They're going to have to... to, to uh, they're gonna have to take some of the drafts. They're gonna have to hit free agency because they just need bodies there. You mm-hmm. look at you know Felix A. D. K. Uzama was their pick last year. Charles Minnie, who signed a two year deal, but he's got a knee that he might not be ready for halfway through the season. So, um, it, Brett, I'm gonna put you on the spot here. I said I don't like to ask this question, but I'm asking. I'm gonna ask you to anyway. Pick 32 as of today. Who do you think the Chiefs take there? So if they stay at 32, if they stay at 32, yeah. Oh man, if they stay at 32, there's so many good options there. I'm going to say, oh, man, this is tough. Let's go. Oh. We've had a lot of Xavier Worthy. That's been a popular pick. Casey, Casey Lab guys have mocked Xavier Worthy to them. I believe Daniel Jeremiah did as well uh, recently at 32. Oh, how about this? Keon Coleman. Okay. It's mainly, so the reason why I hesitated is because I was going through a Rolodex of guys that I think are going to be there, but not ones that I think actually fit KC. I was like, who's actually going to be there that actually makes sense? Yeah. And I think Keon Coleman makes sense. But do you think they trade up? I think they're one of the few teams that's looking to, because mm-hmm. I think they realize that the things they need are not at 32. Right. E- either they go up or they go down. And like if somebody's coming back into the first, try to get a fifth year option on a quarterback. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like Penix or something like that. Huge. I don't think they stay at 32 because I think I just think what they need is a short supply. Yep. And if they don't get that, they're going back. All right. That's Brett Coleman 
of uh, according to your credential, YouTube. Uh, you are YouTube. Technically correct. <laughs> <laughs> Brett Colvin uh, from the Brett Colvin YouTube channel. Appreciate you hopping on and uh, joining us at the the uh, Combine. Enjoy yourself. Thank you for having me. That's going to do it for this uh, KTSN Draft Show special from Indianapolis. We'll have more coming at you later. Uh, for Brett Coleman, I'm Tucker Franklin. We'll talk to you soon.